Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Down But Not Out, the show where founders tell their real life stories of entrepreneurial resiliency. I started this show after my one company, Visitor Q, was dealt a death blow by Google that led to us almost losing all of our clients and all of our revenue. And that would have happened if it wasn't for the hard work, determination, and resiliency of our team. I love a good underdog. So these stories resonate more with me than the story of the $1 billion exit or the story about how your company IPO'd. These are stories of grit meant to inspire you, the listener, to keep fighting. As entrepreneurs and business owners, we will have our backs against the wall multiple times. So let hearing these stories be your fight song, your hoorah, that thing that gets you out of bed on those tough days. This episode is brought to you by my company, VisitorQ. Identify the anonymous companies visiting your website so your sales team can follow up with them. Start your 14-day free trial at VisitorQ.com. Now, let's dive into this episode. Today, I'm joined by Greg Thompson. Greg is a lifelong entrepreneur, having founded and exited several companies throughout his tenure, spanning multiple industries from Facebook games and apps to now workplace well-being and AOTA compliance with his current company, OSG. Greg's career as a founder has no shortage, shortage of interesting tales. Knowing Greg personally, I can say he truly embodies what it means and takes to be an entrepreneur, and he really is one of the most creative individuals I think I've ever met. Greg, thanks for being on the show. Are you ready to share your down but not out story? Let's do it. Awesome. All right. So I don't know if my intro sufficed. So can you give your uh, give yourself a brief intro to the audience? Sure. I would say pretty much uh, going back to when I was twelve. Started off uh, misspent youth of uh, no parties, no girls. Just sort of developing a code of my my uh, bedroom and. That's naturally transitioned into starting my own company when I was first year university, which was a spam filter, which then eventually transitioned into games. Almost every dev who starts out always really loves the idea of doing games and that kind of thing. Uh, and did well enough in games to, to spend a couple of years traveling. And eventually after being in the game industry for, I'd say going on over 10 years, decided I wanted something different, which then brought me to uh, health and safety, which while it was a major departure from what my past was, uh, it was a new challenge and then also an industry that was kind of stuck in the 90s that I figured could have um, some good opportunities to sort of bring technology into it and try to breathe a little bit of uh, new blood into the industry as a whole, which is where I met you, taught yeah. you everything you know. Uh, um, <laughs> this I, is, that's slightly true. I'll give him that. <laughs> That's a good, yeah, that's a good thing to, to mention as uh, Greg might razz me a bit throughout, but I'll try to dish some punches back. Uh, and it's because we do know each other and he was my boss at one point, but I had to quit because he was just too much. He was just too much. Use the and term quit if you want. What's that? You can use the term quit if you want. He walked me out the door. Let's see. <laughs> uh, so I know that uh, when I reached out and I asked if you'd be on the show, you were more than willing. And I brought up kind of the premise of the show and, and you I knew you had a few stories that you could probably tell, uh, but the one that you'd mentioned was around, uh, wasn't the current company you're with OSG, but a previous company and around, uh, I believe a patent troll. Uh, could, you, can, could you walk us through the company that you were working on there before it got to your, your down but not out story? Sure, and I guess uh, to give a little bit of context as to why, because I mean, we talked about this and I was thinking about um, in a, kind of a situation that I'd, Think would be valuable to talk about and i'd say most people sort of can kind of understand oh wow our revenue dropped because major customer left or this kind of change happened and you can kind of wrap your head around it you you can kind of guess maybe how things go um very few people have had to experience any type of real litigation until they've gotten to a certain size um, and, and then unfortunately litigation sort of becomes part of your life and some people are able to avoid it. But I think that sort of recounting this particular thing, um, sort of gives people a little bit of an understanding as maybe how the whole process works, um, at least to the point that we got to, but then on top of that, maybe some ways to help mitigate some of those costs and long-term, um, what ultimately kind of came of it. So, um, I forget your exact initial question now. 
Uh, uh, what was the company? Uh, I know you've had a few and we've, uh, I know of a few, but what was the company? What did it do? And then tell a bit of its story leading up into this, this patent troll and your, your down but not out story. Right. So the company is Big Viking Games, which is still operating today. I had partnered um, with another individual and we had kind of one main game that was generating the majority of our revenue. I think at the time we would give or take around I want to say around two and a half to $3 million a year in revenue. Um, we were working on other things. We we're working on growing that revenue. Um, however, we were fortunate enough to get served by a sheriff, which I didn't even know we had sheriffs. In I didn't know they did that in Canada. Yes. Yes. So we had a sheriff show up to our office. And apparently the only thing sheriffs really do here um, that I'm at least aware of is serve people notices. Maybe there's something else they do. Uh, <laughs> but the sheriff even served us a notice that we were being sued by a patent troll out of the US. Now, the reason I say they're a patent troll, um, and I don't want to give any names because I'm yeah. going to guess that there's some NDA or some agreement that eventually ended up getting signed that sort of included some things. Um, but the reason I'm using the term patent troll is they were a company, a shell company that was just specifically set up. It owned one patent. And it was set up basically just to litigate that one patent. They yeah. didn't make anything. The patent was acquired from another company, et cetera, et cetera. So receive this with, now what's kind of unusual is normally when a patent troll sues you, they are, there's only a demand that comes along with it. And in fact, it may be even before the, the, the lawsuit side of things, it starts with a demand letter. It's like, like hey, a settle, like they want to settle yeah, before. Be like yeah. give us X number of dollars and we'll go away. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, well, maybe fortunately, unfortunately, um, that was not the case in this instance. It literally just started off with a lawsuit. Um, there was no discussion prior. Now, what was sort of interesting, and I think the reason that it did happen this way, is because we were named with, I believe, 11 or 12 other co-defendants. Now, we had companies including EA, Zynga, um, the largest, basically some of the largest game companies in the world at the time yeah. were named alongside us. And there was another company that I knew, uh, the founder of where his revenue was only like 600,000 a year. So like they kind of, I don't know why we fell into the net. I'm not really sure how we got caught up into this, but they really were approaching us the same way that you would approach an EA. You don't mail EA a letter that's like, hey, give us some money and we'll go away. You really have to go right to the lawsuit stage. Yeah. So we kind of, unfortunately, were in this situation where overnight we're being sued um, for patent infringement. And these people are not in the mindset of negotiating. There's like, that's not even on the table. No discussion. So what you end up having to do is, well, not having to do, you for sure need to retain counsel. Um, yeah. And I did pose the question, what happens if you just don't respond? And, <laughs> and the, the, ignore it and it goes away, hopefully, right? The attorney <laughs> I talked to was like, I don't know what happens because that's just not what you do right it, yeah. it's sort of expected to defend yourself um and we were also in the unfortunate or interestingly weird position of being a canadian company yeah. being sued by an american company were you the only canadian company of the 12 or i think they're one of the few obviously one more yeah there may have been one maybe two um coincidentally there may have been two more um we weren't targeted. They would just happen to be where we would have been. Yeah. And um, where was I going with that? Sorry. Um, so, yes, got the um, the demand letter. We're like, well, I guess we talked to a lawyer. And so, pretty quickly, you're starting to interview a couple of lawyers because now we're in this situation where we can't use any of our own counsel because Canadian counsel can't defend against an, a U.S. Uh, patent case. Yeah. Um, and even if we did have, we did have some US like business counsel that we used here and there, but they were a small firm. So they didn't even have in house people that even dealt with patent cases. You weren't expecting a patent lawsuit. So you didn't retain US counsel for that. Yeah. Sure. So we <laughs> I think we interviewed two or three different firms um, and ended up partnering with, I believe, 10, nine other of the companies that were involved. Yeah. 
So in total, there were 10 of us. I believe that there may have been two or three that decided to go on their own or two of them partnered up and one decided to go on their own. I don't recall. And I think the, as I was mentioning, there was the one company that only had 600,000 in revenue. I, I believe they managed to get it dismissed real quick when they went to the, the troll and they're just like, look, we've got nothing here and we're almost out of business. Like, yeah, yeah. I think it was down to two people, one person, like it was not a good thing. <laughs> and so they kind of got dropped pretty quick. And so what we quickly encountered, unfortunately, was the realization that this was not going to be cheap, uh, even come close to cheap. So uh, we were sort of hearing that just to get to trial, like if we do this alone, to get to trial is going to cost us about 2 million US. Um, this is not really countering like every expense we're going to have, but yeah. it is, and who knows what happens at trial. And then at trial, things get really expensive, right? Yeah. Now you're like paying really top dollar lawyers. And I'll get to kind of how that can all go down as well. Like we're in one day, you're spending tens of thousands of dollars. And so we were working with the other parties to sort of go, okay, what's sort of the route we're going to take. And at the time this matters for the, for the later part of it, is we were, uh, the case was out of um, San Jose, I believe. Was it San Jose? Um, yeah, I believe that's where it was. San Diego. California. Out of, San Diego. Out of San Diego. Um, and so, but most of the companies were out of San Fran. That's an important thing, right? So we ended up having to go down by we, I think it was just myself that had to go this time around had to go to the court um, in California just for a mediation. So this was probably after about three months, there was just a mediation, which anybody who's never been involved in any type of case, what courts try to do is prevent it from going through the court system because it's a lot yeah. cheaper. So uh, they force the parties to get into the same room and try to hash it out. See if there's some medium, see, see if there's like a, basically a middle ground that can be worked out. And in certain number of cases, there are, and then they can just totally avoid the court, the court system. Yeah. Um, and sorry, my, my allergies are a little bit acting oh, up here. That's good. So, um, and so I, I believe it was, I flew down and back within like 18 hours, right? Flew down, met my lawyer there, um, who was also representing others, but then you also get your own little special lawyer it's just it's a money with the same firm though yeah that, yeah right yeah, yeah. um i think my guy was maybe representing like three or four of the the group some had their own counsel that they brought because you have to remember this one are really large companies yeah yeah and you're flying in by yourself with your bag still in your hand <laughs> <laughs> um and so yeah i'm trying to think there's a whole other situation another time so um <laughs> long story short was there for two hours and they gave a number that they wanted 950,000 US. To settle. To settle. Yeah. From, like, you, from you guys specifically. Us. And then the other companies would have got their number as well. Don't know. Don't even know if they got a number. Yeah. Um, so actually, I guess let me take a step back. They initially said they wanted three and a half million. <laughs> and it's a, it's a steep and drop. So I left basically the number three and a half million. Was, was the number they did. Then they came back to us later after we're like, um, I think your math might be off on something <sighs> and, and came back to a smaller number. Now, this would probably be a good time to explain roughly what the patent was or is. I don't even know if it's still valid. I don't look it up. I didn't yeah. <laughs> it is basically a patent around the ability to buy Pay for, we'll say, hmm, special privileges. Let's, there's some examples in the patent. I don't remember them. Within a game, you mean? Within a oh, game to buy. No, 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 Nicholas. No, it's not the okay. <laughs> um, This is. So not even specific at all. There's any special privilege. I don't even know if there was anything in a, about a game in it. It was like, I think there's one example where there's a speed limit that if you've paid more, you're allowed to drive faster down the road. I think there may be another situation 
where if you pay more, you might get your pizza delivered faster. Like yeah. it was the concept of paying for better service. Like it's kind of this weird thing. You're paying for better service, but you're paying for a privilege. You're paying for an upgrade. You're paying Can for- I go, a- If I sit at the front seat at a hockey game, in front row, is that considered, like that's special privilege, right? Like I'm $18 you know versus a $50 I, ticket. I don't know. I, yeah. I, I think the patent was borderline, well, should have never been issued, but it yeah. was. And now you got it, that to deal with. Um, and they basically were claiming that they invented the concept of <laughs> Okay. And so, and to take a little sidestep, um, I actually tracked down the guy who is actually credited with the concept of upgrades in a game. Yeah. Uh, and we ended up having to pay this, not having, I think we ended up hiring this guy as a witness or an expert or something like that. I think yeah. we ended up him like $150,000, $200,000. He made more, probably made more off of this uh, being an expert in the case than he actually probably ever made off his game. But I don't know the details. <laughs> yeah. So this is a while ago. This is going back. A lot of money in patents, apparently. Yeah, the sounds of it. And litigation is where there's a lot of yeah. money. <laughs> um, so the kind of fast forwarding, um, the initial crime that we were like, look at, you're claiming, because they were wanting a blanket percentage of all of our sales. Yeah. Right? I believe they wanted 5% of our sales for the last five years and moving forward or is, uh, and then they wanted it forward until the patent ended. Cause there was only like five years left in the patent. So yeah. I think that they projected our sales at like 80 some million or something like that over that 10 year span. Yeah, and we're like, nah, uh, that's not what what our, <laughs> what our sales are. And then, and again, this is off the top of my head, but I think we were like, look at our sales are closer. If you look at that, to probably about thirty five million over so the next five cool. years. Yeah. So then they think they took five percent of that, or maybe it was a little bit less. I don't recall. Maybe maybe the settlement number wasn't nine fifty. Maybe it was a million and a half. I know there was a settlement for nine fifty. That may have been their third offer. So but do they been, want that up front or do they want like a royalty back? Thumb, thumb, boom, they go away. Yeah, you know, they want <laughs> now. I'm sure they would have been nice with us, Nick, and they would have taken a payment plan. Yeah, yeah, payout. <laughs> Take a payout, please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but this you have to remember, we were small fish in this. Yeah. It cost them almost no more money to keep us in it because that's the sort of thing about this, right? Is they had our case, whether we were in it or not, didn't really make their expenses go up anymore. Not yeah. much, a little bit, but not that much. In the same way that we were pooling our defense, they're effectively pooling their I guess all of you. They were waiting for to get the 12 of you or, or something like that. Right. They want and the bigger. The yeah. Real money was in the Zingas, the EAs, this kind of stuff. And then here's the other problem. They didn't want to negotiate with us because they then set a precedent yeah. for, for the standards of what they end up looking for. Yeah, yeah. So they couldn't just be like, you know what? Give us a hundred grand and you're out. It's and all- get rid of you because they would have, yeah. Right, because then they're setting the precedent. At least this is what the attorneys were saying. They set the precedent for arguably. So we were kind of dragged along, even if they were willing to go lower simply because we were caught in the net. For all yeah. They realized pretty quick that we were not the intended target and they thought <laughs> we were bigger. And you have to remember- they're not even experts in the first place, right? They just probably did some Google searching, found some stuff because at that point I already sold the game to Zynga. So they might have confused us thinking we were somehow associated, maybe a sister company, a sub, I have no idea. Um, And so proceed forward. We, um, I get You didn't take that settlement. Uh, We did not. Come back to Canada. And so now I think we get our first bill from the lawyers, from the lawyers. And I think our first bill was around $300,000. Now split 10 ways. Oh, that was okay. That wasn't just your cut. Okay. Yeah. Split 10 ways. So, but you have to think this is like a big chunk, 30 grand fine. Um, But it's starting to hurt our pocketbook a little bit. 
And I'm really concerned because I go, we're not going to settle for a million and a half. We literally don't have it. And yeah. margins aren't that like, it's, it's basically an impossible thing to do. And they have no interest in even negotiating with us at, at this point, right? Like, so now the real work starts because up until the, this point, there's almost not a whole lot. Now you start to do discovery. And um, are you familiar with what discovery is? Uh, where they hand over all their evidence against you. And it's like well, a package of, yeah, of some so sort. They don't hand over stuff that you think they're going to want. What yeah. you are allowed to do is ask for stuff. Yes. Like the, so, the evidence against you. Is that, is that the idea there? Well, they can ask for almost anything, right? They yeah. can be like, anything that they believe is pertinent. And then it, and again, I'm no lawyer here, obviously. The, this is not legal advice. Um, my understanding is it's kind of your responsibility or be your burden to show that it wasn't applicable, right? Like it's kind of the assumption that if you're requesting it, you're given the benefit of the doubt that it is good. Now, obviously you're not requesting their children's birth certificates, right? Yeah. Because that's done in bad faith. And I believe they can go to the judge and be like, look, this is ridiculous. Um, at the same time, if someone, let's say they requested, uh, emails that contained these specific names you also can't print off one word per page and ship them three container <laughs> full paper. just like to mess with them over. yeah correct you can't you can't kind of mess with people or fuck people over now what's really important though is you do not need to create data for people so let's say that i came to you and i said i want any documents that contain your sales by month yeah. You could go look at, we don't have that. We have our sales, but we do not have it broken down by month. Now, you are probably not going to just ask me this. You're going to say, we want your sales. We want any summaries. We want any discussions. We want any discussions around patents that you may have violated, do believe violated, um, things where you discounts, why you did things, emails around promotion, anything that even remotely is related. And I think it probably took internally, oh boy, hundreds of hours to compile this stuff. To get the, the entire discovery together that they're asking yeah. for. All the stuff that they're asking for. Because you have to think, one item can be massive stuff. You go, yeah. we want all communication through all channels related to discounts. Yeah. So you got to come up with that your, somehow. Your, yeah. So now you're yeah. exporting emails. If you're, we were using, I think, hip chat at the time. So like hip chat stuff. And like, they just start to really add up. And yes, maybe we have the records in a database. Yeah. So this, so therefore we had to do it because they theoretically exist, but you got to do these queries. And it was just, a, it was a ton of work. So not yeah. only are you paying the lawyers and money out of your pocket, it's also right. taking up your time and your uh, and your employees' my time. My full time. Yeah, to and fight I, this thing. It probably took up two employees full time for a number of weeks, and just the stress of it, and yeah. you're sort of like really focused on. It. Yeah. I want to like. Do you think this that part of it held the company back at all? Like, not yeah. even just the money side of it. The fact that you weren't focusing on growing the company, you weren't. Were, as a company, we are almost in a state of limbo for about nine months. Yeah, because of this ridiculous. Yeah, because uh, you can't really invest in the future. Yeah. Um, because you don't know how much your next bill is going to be. <laughs> uh, or like at this point, you didn't know if you're going to win this thing. Right. Well, it, well, it, it could have sunk the whole company. Here's the one thing that you quickly realize when you're dealing in legal things is you can win the battle and lose the war. Because you go, yeah, we won. And you're like, yeah, but you've got no money. Yeah, so you just burnt it all winning this thing. Way back to the American Canadian thing, obviously a legal system that's different. Here we can, if you're, vic if you're come on, out ahead or in victory kind of thing, you can go after the person for legal fees. Yeah. In the US, you can't. Unless it was a super egregious situation, again, not a lawyer. So we were in a situation that I'm like, even if we won, how much did it cost us to win? Yeah. Like, would it, 
been huge. So you really yeah. and you're a young company at this point, right? Like you're three, four, five years old. Oh, it's in the partnership, like with the, we kind of rolled it into this new partnership type thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, only had been like less than a year. Like, it, so you it, don't have a ridiculous. You might have three million dollars in annual revenue, but you're all of it's invested into regrowth, growth of the company. Your employee, yeah, yeah, yeah. like, you don't have that in the bank. No, you don't have all. anything in the bank, right? Like your cash flow is pretty low. Oh, yeah. as a corporation, yeah. no. Yeah. yeah, no. Like, and so that's the thing. Like, everything was being hundred percent pulled back into the, the company. Like, yeah. so it's not like we had an extra thirty thousand every <laughs> yeah. month. Go away. Or this a million dollars that they want, a million and a half. You would have to scale back, or it yeah, impossible to even yeah. come up with because yeah, there was no cash sitting in there. Yeah, um, and so in order for us to pay it, we would have had to effectively lay off, I guess, half our staff. And then somehow keep our revenue going for another year. Yeah. Just pay that. Like, you know what I mean? It just, it wouldn't have worked. Yeah. Um, and so we got our first bill. We pay it. Fine. We're doing discovery. You'll now, this is another reason why it's a patent troll and why it works well for them is because it's very easy to ask for something. It's very expensive to produce it. They have nothing to produce. What can I ask a company that doesn't do it? <laughs> so it's just a shell little company, right? Yeah. Like there's at this point, did you know if they went after anyone else? Or is this their first lawsuit okay. for oh I I I think this was their first. I don't think they yeah. tested the waters with anybody else. I don't You're think the guinea pig here. <laughs> yeah. Um, they went out swinging right off the hop. Yeah. And so we asked for a couple things like what what do you guys know about us right like where's our name where do you come up with our sales estimates all that kind of stuff and they yeah. end up giving us i think like 20 30 pages of stuff right like <laughs> we've sent thousands and thousands of pages yeah now there's a reason why i say that lawyers being what they are like to make sure you're not sending anything now you have to remember they've requested this from us from all of the companies now, Zing is going to have, an EA is going to have massive. Even more. Yeah. yeah. But remember, we're sharing legal fees. Split, split evenly. Let's see. Yes. Now, there were only a couple things that we paid for on our own. If it was very much specific to just our case. But in this yeah. particular instance, their theory was since everyone is being asked realistically the exact same thing, and they know whether they're being asked the same thing. Um, it kind of all falls into a similar type. So everyone splits the bill. They have, they like to review all of this before they hand it off to the other side to make sure that you're not sending over something you shouldn't. And yeah, yeah. fair, but on top of that, it's a really great way to get billable hours in. Now, I guess this would be a great place to say that intellectual property lawyers are not cheap. Uh, that specialize in patent litigation and especially in California. So around here, a business lawyer in London, Ontario, I don't know, partners like 350, 400 bucks an hour Canadian. Yep. yep. Which is looking at around 300 US. Might be able to get an associate for 250, right? Yeah. Toronto is probably looking at a partner closer to like 400. Yeah. US. Right, give or take somewhere on there. I assume a lot of your audience would be Americans here, so I figured do American dollars. Now, this would have been, oh boy, this would have been over 10 years ago. So I'm sure rates have gone up. In here. <laughs> Our just behind the scenes lawyer attorneys were, I believe, 650 US an hour. Because they're from the Bay Area, right? They're right, and they specialize. Yeah. Their juniors were like, 500 an hour and their trial lawyers were 850 an hour Jeez, this was 10 years ago so like you said that's that's yeah. cheap yeah so um i let's hope their juniors were reviewing these i don't really <laughs> but it wasn't i think it couldn't have been more than like a month later a month and change later we get a seventy five thousand dollars bill because they're now prepping all this stuff because is that your split of it or is that everybody's i was just our portion i think yeah my portion sorry my portion so yeah. i think we got a bill for like seven hundred and fifty thousand combined yeah um, and you're like holy shit this is not cheap now 
this is where things get interesting. And you haven't even gone to trial. Your lawyer, I'm not saying your lawyers didn't do anything, but there's been, no end in sight at this point. There's, we have, we barely started the yeah. process. Like yeah. to me, yes, you've kind of done some discovery, but that's, that's common. Discovery is like still child's play. And so what interesting thing transpired, and this was pivotal for us, and we didn't know it at the time. And it turns out, because when we all 10 of us decided to do this, we naturally had a legal framework that we all followed as well. We had a document. Yeah. This is how everything gets split up. This is how everything works. So we followed everything to the agreement, but I'll explain how we ended up getting away like bandits. So all nine people that we partnered with, I think were from San Francisco. Maybe one of them dropped out. Maybe it was that $600,000 company. I forget exactly, but I believe everyone yeah. we partnered with was out of San Fran. And maybe company, one company wasn't, but they decided to move. Everyone wanted to, they all wanted the case to be moved to San Francisco court because uh, that's where their in-house attorneys were. That's where the actual attorneys that were working on the case were out of, all that kind of stuff. So the thought was, hey, let's move it there. Makes more sense. They weren't sure if it was going to get approved or not. Yeah. The request was put through. This decision delay was going to delay everything by about three months, if I recall correctly, right? Because the decision had to be made, all that kind of stuff. So they put the request in. We were like, what the hell do we care? We're in Canada. Whether I'm flying to San Fran or wherever, it doesn't, doesn't make a difference for you. Yeah. And we, we just want this to get over with because the longer it takes, the more it's going to cost. So we just left it. We had, there was no advantage to us. Thank God we did that. So remember, I said there was going to be a three months for them to figure it out. Yeah. All night, they eventually got approved. But and all, was, it, was it the opposing counsel that was approving? Or was that a judge at that point? The judge that approved. The judge, that, yeah. that transferred. Now, still all the same case. Yeah. But just, I think, happening. In a different area. Yeah. Jurisdictions. I don't understand yeah. the full details, but um, I don't know how that worked. It doesn't matter because it turned out it didn't matter. All got approved. Now... We're now, remember, there's three months. During the three months, it was in like a limbo for them. Ours was not. Ours continued. So now we're the ones racking up expenses. Well, they're yeah. not. But everyone's still splitting at 10% each. Okay? Now, so now we had one expense that was our own because everyone, and like I mentioned, if it was specifically just for you, you paid for it. If it was yeah. some for the group, like the expert opinion guy right like we uh because that's important if you're trying to invalidate the patent which is also very expensive but you kind of want to know what your position is when you're negotiating and all those types of things and we um so i just noticed that my laptop is starting to but there we go we're back in business um we ended up having to do as part of discovery there's also um just what they call dispositions where you can basically ask the other party any questions you want. Yep. And again, my understanding is, is it's pretty much, it's assumed that if you're asking it, there's a good reason you're asking it. You don't really, you can't really refuse to answer a and question. And you can't really lie either too, right? Because it's used as lies. evidence. You can't lie. It's being recorded. Yeah. Um, there's your lawyer, their lawyer, I believe. I don't know if there was a stenographer or not. Yeah. Um, and well, not, not, it's kind of a whatever. And so I went, I had to go to, I think I, we met them in, sorry, these guys were out of LA. I apologize. They were out of, or no, that's where we ended up meeting in LA. I don't know. Maybe the opposing council was in LA. I don't remember, but that's where okay. we ended up. Yeah. However, I wasn't the only one that had to go. Another key employee had to go and be questioned as well because they wanted the, the product owner as well. So uh, another gentleman had to, to join. So we both flew down to LA the day before. We met with two of our attorneys, luckily both trial attorneys, so that's now 
850 bucks a pop. Yeah. Um, we met with them so they could coach us through basically how to ask, like how to answer the questions, what you're ultimately trying to do. I think we did that for six hours. Between the, the two of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. they gave us I guess, a two for one deal, but there was also <laughs> two of them. So yeah. no, but I meant you were being questioned for six hours. No, they were coaching us for six oh, hours. Oh, for six hours. This is, remember this two for, two, two, for, two for one deal. <laughs> but there was also two of them. So really I guess yeah. it gets canceled out. Yeah. So what eight fifty seventeen hundred dollars an hour? Yeah. For six hours, really on six, basically ten grand just for our coaching. Never mind the cost of getting there, hotels, and the inconvenience. Yeah. The next day, we had um, another. I think it came out to eight hours, but each right. So they came to another sixteen hours. Um, Plus, we had to, since they didn't live in LA, we had to cover all of their expenses. Their travel, and, yeah. All their travel, their meals, which they had no problem paying for our lunch. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was on you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and we also had to pay them, I think, a certain amount for, no, it wasn't for non working hours, but it was like for prep or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Long story short, by the time we were done that, two days, I think our bill was. 45,000 US. Is just, that just the prep? The prep and then just the recording, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but still, 45 grand, which was our cost alone. Yeah. So now this is like, again, what are we up to now? I forget. I may have even been missing some bills in between. I got right? you at 150, give or take. So yeah, far. when it's all said and done, yeah. our legal alone was, I believe, 350. Yeah. So after 10% this, of a year revenue, right? Give or take. Oh, that's yeah. a substantial amount. Yeah. And so, but that, that was just the legal part because yeah. there is a little bit of a story at the end there. Um, yeah. And so, arguably, uh, we, were, we were ahead. We were now still had like, we were past this, but now you have to think our side reviews their paperwork reviews this stuff they had the questions because they then had to ask the other side questions what are they asking them though is there much on that side of oh no like, but it's substance on there funny. <laughs> <laughs> and so again now luckily that was split and there yeah. was a and then i think they were they're trying to they're starting to build a case right like for yeah. twice because they need to Obviously, they can't just suddenly be like, oh, shit, here we are with no real defense, no case. They had experts. They had internal staff. It seemed like every month it was like another, here's 50 grand, here's 50 grand, here's 50 grand. So like, that, excuse me, that one month where we had to pay 45, that was 45 plus our contribution of the 50, right? Like it was yeah. just money flying out the door constantly. And until it got to about 350. Now, here's the thing is that was our cost. Fine. In total, the whole party had probably, if you exclude that 50 grand that was probably just ours alone, yeah. had three million dollars up at this point for all of us. Before trial. Correct. Oh, yeah. We're not yeah. even the trial still. <laughs> there's, there's normally a second settlement conference before trial. There's sometimes even like it, the judge can do whatever the hell they want if they. Think yeah, this is going to go on for years, right? Like you're not. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And and they're like, if it gets to trial, oh shit, sky's the limit, right? Depends. <laughs> yeah. So you have to think. If you win or lose, it's never over because the other person then appeals it. Yeah. And you can appeal it higher and higher. like it could. Oh man, the, just the the floodgates start opening at that point. So. We're now in the situation where we've paid 300 and some thousand. To get to that point alone, probably would have cost us around $2 million. Maybe just shy of two. Um, because you have to remember, you're paying for some of the other work that other people, yeah. that we all split equally. Um, but that would have been, like if we just got to there alone, that would have cost us maybe about $2 million, give or take. So we, we really benefited from this group. 
Well, we then get to the point where, and remember, Nick, you have to remember, these other people are three months behind, but they're starting to, to get on some expenses. Yeah. So we found a situation where we realized, we're like, holy shit, if we can settle our way out of this, we're not going to have to pay any of their expenses. Because you're out. Like you're not no. part of the, you're not part of the tent at that point. Your, your case is done. Yeah. Right. So they've been covering 90% <laughs> of our costs. <laughs> I'm starting to see where this is going. <laughs> if we get out, we don't even have to pay 10% of theirs. Yeah. So we were talking to them at some point and they recognized that we just like weren't worth pursuing, right? We managed to build a pretty convincing case. By them, like, you mean the, the opposing okay. counsel? The, yeah, yeah. So we made it very clear to them because they're like, blah, blah, blah. even if we go completely off of their logic being valued, that they're a hundred percent. They didn't deserve more than fifty thousand dollars because we carved it and carved it and carved it and carved it. And they're like, "Fine, give us fifty grand and walk away." Now it was a hard pill to swallow to pay that fifty grand because you're like, it's kind of extortion money. But yeah. we knew that if we even stuck around for an extra month our bill was going to be more than a hundred grand in legal or 50 grand in legal fees. Yeah. We're part of the group. So you took it and you ran, you, so you took the deal. Took it, we got out, we were out of yeah. the group. And I'll be honest with you. We did not go into the agreement with the group realizing that that was going to happen. This was not yeah. a devious plan. It happened to work out that way. Yeah. And obviously the other people in the group were not so pleased once we got out. Hey, you got um, lucky. Let's, we got really right. lucky. Yeah. Because had it not changed courts, had not all that sort of stuff happened, we would have been right side along and our bill could have easily been way higher. Yeah. Uh, but, and again, I want to make it clear. It was not our intention to get it <laughs> because we couldn't have even- We'll, we'll keep that, that in for sure, yeah. We couldn't yeah. have predicted that no. that was going to happen the way it did. Um, however, I didn't feel like guilty at the end to be like, oh man, we got off way better than other people. Had yeah. our been right off the hop to be like, look at this is how we're going to get in, screw them and get out. That would have been hard to predict anyway. Them switching courts and being three months behind. Yeah. Right. What I will say, however, is if anyone is ever in a situation where they are able to share, which highly, highly recommend, if you can ever like mount a, a defense together with someone, do yeah. it. Well, you said you would have been at two million in legal fees right. uh, when you were at two hundred. Right, uh, 200 grand. Because you have to remember, like, th there's some, because you're paying some of, like, the larger yeah. companies, since they're way larger, their expenses were going to be higher, so you end up paying yeah, a little yeah. bit more of theirs. Um, point being is, if you're ever in the situation, though, where you're sharing, make sure you're never in a situation where someone else settles out, that you're ended up getting screwed on the yeah, old for the rest bill, of the bill. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, or like making sure that like you're not behind or if there's, you could even say, well, you got to at this point, maybe if you take it to that point, you share. I don't really know. I'm sure there's other lawyers and other cases that have dealt with this. Yeah. I'll be honest with you. I was really surprised with our agreement that there was no. You, know, <laughs> you almost expected to have to continue to pay, I right? We expected us to pay, have to pay some type of language that would have kept us in to pay a certain fair share of whatever. There was yeah. nothing. And so we kind of stepped back going, it would be stupid to stay in from a financial perspective. So we ended up getting out for, at the time, half a million Canadian uh, with exchange rate for 400,000 US was the damage to this whole thing. Um, never mind about nine months. Maybe it was a year. It was one nine months to a year, something like that. And the reason I say nine months to a year is because I don't think anything really happened for the first three months. Yeah. Like you're sort of sitting there and you're just waiting on a little miscellaneous stuff. Like nothing really happened right off the bat. Um, overall, we got out pretty unscathed. Now, not the 400,000 wasn't detrimental. It really sucked. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't pocket change for you guys. Fortunately, you can write it off on your taxes. Not that that <laughs> helps a whole lot when you're not generating a lot of profit. Yeah. But you're yeah. able to use it a little bit. And overall, it's it was a hard lesson in the realities of, I will at least say the American legal system, where I, 
I'm not saying the Canadian legal system is perfect in any respect. However, as you know, as a Canadian boy, we are not a litigious society in general for the most part. And the fact that you can be responsible for covering someone's legal expenses, if you do a privilege- Deters thing, a lot of, yeah, that garbage cases. Yeah. Um, and that you're not, you're not given like over the top legal fees. And in fact, normally you'll get back two thirds of what your legal fees are, or two thirds of reasonable legal fees, which I'm still fine with, right? And I'm yeah. not saying that there's zero cases in the US, I believe, and again, not a lawyer, I believe there's slap suits and stuff like that, that they're coming around being like, these are totally agreed discharge, like accusations, you're going to have to pay. I think with Stormy Daniels and Trump, I think there was some example of that where she had to pay. Yeah. I think, But that is so rare. And that's like a very small, small subsect um, of the of the legal thing. So I would say that it's not something, especially on the Canadian side of things that I ever expected to have to deal with around uh, a patent troll because you hear about it and this kind of stuff and suddenly it gets very it doesn't real. happen here in canada right and there's you, nothing, you rarely hear these stories yeah there's nothing you can do about it. you either go yeah. to business or i don't really know like and that was a real just, possibility for you guys right to go out of, like if, if if your legal fees continued let's say you had in that agreement where you still had to pay 10 percent even after you'd settle like you would have been in millions of millions of dollars uh, oh, yeah. if they went to trial do you know what ended up happening been, with that case as well, well these other people fought it off for, right? Yeah. I don't know if this trial went on for another six. I don't know if it actually even went to trial. Yeah. I don't know if it all settled out before. I'll be honest with you, I didn't pay attention to it after we got yeah. out. But it would not be crazy to imagine that as a group, the legal bills were significantly higher. Than They're ramping up very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Like we were expecting if it went to trial, even as a group, it costing us, I believe, almost a million dollars each they just yep. to get to trial so you have to think yes you're splitting it amongst the group but you're still like it's still expensive right so yeah, not, yeah. well a million is better than two million if it gets yep. that <laughs> and we were just really lucky the fact that since they were so delayed the rest of them they yep. were paying yep. our expenses 90 percent, where we were having to pay 10 percent of nothing because yep. it was just sitting there uh so we really got away really, really way better off than we should have in hindsight. And yeah, so that's kind of a- Yeah, you dodged you dodged a bullet there. It took you nine months, it took you 12 months. That probably was a-, was a Distraction. Yeah, distraction. Um, did set the, it, I know the company ended up doing very well after. Are you able to share a bit about that? So after those nine to 12 months, it was about a year and a half into Big Viking. Um, I know you exited Big Viking. Yeah, I wouldn't say that like there was any lesson specifically because of that or something we did because of that. I would say we're just running the business and doing certain yeah. um, activities from that. And just because so, again, over the time you release new stuff, you improve it, et cetera, et cetera. I would say that sort of the brush with death was more the realistic. I mean, had we been the only people named, it almost would have been a death sentence. And yeah. I almost wish that there was like some advice you could be like, oh, if this ever happens, this is how <laughs> you prevent it. This is how you get out. Yeah. My thing would be you hope to God that you're defending yourself with somebody else. Yeah. And there also is this bravado around it's not fair. It's not fair. And you go, you know what? You're right. It's not fair. Life's and not fair. Yeah, and I hate it, but you have to kind of get past it and accept the fact that you just need to bite the bullet and do what makes the most business sense. Yeah, right. There's a reason why you, if, if a mugger comes to you with a gun, you'll give them a hundred bucks. It's not because it's fair. It's because it's the you do what you have to do. Do it at the time. Yeah, and if someone comes to you and says, "Look at." I don't like you. I've got tons of money. And my goal is just to make your life miserable. I'm going to take this right to trial and I'll lose. And I don't care because you're yeah. not going to get money of it. And it's going to cost you, let's say, say a million dollars to go through trial that you don't have. You, there's nothing you can actually do about it. And if I go, or you can give me 20 grand now, you're just going to give me 20 grand. Yeah. 
you gotta apologize and bark like a dog on video. <laughs> yeah. This is ridiculous. Now, I'm sure there, this borders on extortion, depending on yeah. how you approach it. I'm, I'm black, but you get my point. Like, there's very little you can do about it. And obviously, I hope around the patent thing. I think there's been some patent changes over the last number of years. I think in the Obama administration, there was some. Some. I know there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of anti-patent uh, individuals out there that just say that whole office is ridiculous the way it's managed and the things you can get patent and patented. <laughs> And, and uh, I, yeah. I don't blame the patent office per se, because their job is impossibly hard. Like yeah. they're the arbiters of whether something's new or not. That's so hard. They're Googling yeah. their own internal documents, but I mean, they're no, they're experts, but like you can't know everything. And is no. it novel? Is it this? And, that? and I'm sure there's so much that they push back. And then the problem with the system though, is when it gets approved, now the it's very difficult to get it reversed. It's so yes. much easier to get a patent approved than it is to overturn a patent. Because now the onus is on you to say it's not valid, which is yeah. way harder. Uh, and that's the other thing about patent trolls is they, if they ever think that this is, things are going to go sideways for them, they'll settle or just drop the case. Because if their patent gets overturned in court, they can no longer use it. Yeah. So there's only been a couple companies i think that have really stood up i think newegg is one of them where if they get a patent case they push it to the very end they do not settle they'll counter sue they will just try to reverse the patent they'll go all out hard and i think we've managed to reverse a number of patents but what's interesting about their strategy is it's almost like the the kid who fights back to the bully bullies stop picking on them because they don't get beat up and or that have that confrontation they don't want a kid who swings back well newegg probably doesn't get nearly any patent trolls going after them now because they know they're not they're <laughs> yeah. they don't take shit exactly so <laughs> yeah it's a short term and that's actually another thing that some of the patent um lawyers were saying to us or the intellectual property lawyers are saying to us they're like word spreads fast in this patent troll community because they're so incestuous and one company may own 30, 40, 500 other of these shell companies that all have these. Yeah. Once a company starts rolling over really quick, they know to, to put the hounds they on. They attack. Yeah. They know what they're getting out of it, right? It's a it's a system for them. They're like, we get 50,000 each one of them. We throw at this and it's a dollar in, a dollar out. So yeah. that was also the other thing of like, you got to fight. Otherwise, you just become a victim and you make yeah. it too easy and then you become like, so it wasn't an easy decision, but overall, I would say that uh, it sounds like the right one well for us. And yeah. overall, I would say that ideally no one has to go through the litigation side of things or the legal. I've actually never made it to trial before in any legal case that I've ever done, um, whether I've been on the defense or the, yeah. the, the, the offensive side of things. I know I got you sued at one point, but it's a. Uh... That's a, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's, that's a story. That's another story. We'll go into that another time. I do want to, I do want to kind of summarize on this because I think it'll be good to hear the, the uh, trajectory. So you had big Viking games, you grew it to close to 3 million or so. Uh, you got this lawsuit that set you back. It could have put you out of business, right? It could have, could have been a bankruptcy depending on how the cards, uh, the cards uh, were played and got laid out. But it ended up only putting you back, well, I say only, <laughs> uh, close to half a million, give or take, uh, yeah. US. And then you ended up, uh, I just know this because I know you and I know the uh, the London community, you end up growing Big Viking Games to, uh, I, I don't even know what I can say, but three to I four times north, that. North of 10. Yeah, north of 10. And then I know you exited Big Viking. Um, so you did really well on that from, so there was a big return from you fighting and winning that as well. Oh, for sure. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, in hindsight, we could have, if I could have come up with the million dollars to just make it go away if that settlement, I think at one point they were willing to walk away for 950. Not saying it would have been the right thing to do in hindsight, like looking at yeah. it, but maybe it would have been at the same time if I could have just ended up focusing on the business and not being distracted and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, But then you also feel like a victim, right? And you just end up being kind of pissed at the whole thing. So it all ended up working out well. But yeah, I would say- And you feel like you won. It, it, it sounds like you won to me. In yeah. a weird way. And I didn't feel like I won with the patent troll. I felt like yeah. I won with the agreement with the other people and how we split <laughs> these up. Yeah. So 
in a weird way, we won, but we didn't beat our enemy. We ended up sort of winning against our, our fellow friends in a it's weird like, way. Yeah. It's like you won the war and also lost the war. Because yeah. You, you, yeah, you lost to them, but you ended up winning overall. You know what? You, you won? Like you, you live to fight another day, but you yeah. lost a couple limbs doing it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Won if you're you didn't die. How about we go that way? If, yeah. if we define winning as not dying, yes, we won. That's a good uh, way to put it. Uh, how was the? How were those nine to twelve months? Was that like a stressful? Really? It was. It sucked. You said. Yeah, I was like, well, I guess this is all done, right? Yeah. Like, in I would. I've never had cancer or yeah. diagnosed with cancer. I'm guessing if someone is diagnosed with a terminal illness or not even terminal, let's imagine I was diagnosed with stage two cancer, stage three, but they're yeah. like, you know what? This has got a high survivability rate. But let's say this whole process lasted six months. I don't personally believe that I would be like, you know what? I really got to work on my lawn. Like, oh, I really got to repaint my shed. I got to like, I should really redo the bathroom. I'm sure it's just you're so consumed about survival and the realities of it that you're not thinking about how am I going to improve my life for the next 10, 15 years? How many yeah. people start new businesses a week into a cancer diagnosis? I don't yeah. think it happens, right? Because you're so consumed. And a fear is really what it is because you're yeah. like, well, into the future. Everything you've right. built, everything you built is about to be flushed away. Right. And I would say that that is the thing is you're like, Cancer doesn't require you to do anything, but it can mentally consume all of your mental cycles to the yeah. point that you don't end up being productive. And I would say that that is what ended up happening is like you're Googling stuff that you think is maybe going to help the case. You're Googling stuff. You're like, it just ends up being weird and you end up just spinning your, shirt, your tires a lot. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, that, I would say that that had almost maybe more of an impact long term. Uh, that there was almost a year of just lost productivity and just fear, right? Like you were living in fear the whole time. Yeah. I remember uh, we went to look at wedding venues during the whole Google thing. It was literally uh, the week Google shut us down. We had all these uh, wedding venue tours booked up and, uh, and we were going to look at wedding. Ven I couldn't think about wedding venues. I was literally messaging my team while we're getting a tour uh, trying to try, on a Saturday to try no, to rebuild this thing. If I can afford the wedding anymore. Yeah, actually though, I don't even know if I have a job at the end of this week. So, um, so yeah, I, I agree with that. It consumes you. It really does. It, and it's a fear. Uh, I remember like the, the gut, just the gut feeling at all times of just being scared. Uh, yeah. And, and it's also a situation that you try not to pass, like you would have tried to not pass it on to your partner. Yeah. And as a boss or as an, an owner, you try not to pass it on to your staff, right? And yeah. so like you're in the situation where you're trying to shoulder the burden. And now I did have a partner, like a business partner at the time that we were able to kind of share to a certain extent, but we were also, I'll say a uh, pretty big difference in personalities. So yeah. we approached it drastically different and I'm not a worrier, but I am a person who's a realist. Yes. And and as much as you want to think optimistically, even like as a cancer diagnosis example, you can still think optimistically, yeah. but that doesn't mean you're, you're not a hundred percent worry free, right? You know, it's in the back of your head, you know it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I think that was really good, Greg. You, you provided a lot there. Is there anything else you wanted to, to share to add in? Cause I think you, you covered the story perfectly. You, you really showed that, uh, uh, company was up and coming. It was it was doing really well, and then this 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 patent troll threw a, a wrench in your wrench in your tire and really uh, threw you off for nine to twelve months, but could have put you completely out uh, and and shared some good tips on how you fought back to that. I would say overall, and this is like not related to this exactly, but it's in the same realm. I've become quite comfortable with legal documents, reading them, uh, writing we'll call it writing a loose bullet point things that I feel a lawyer could, could using do. a template and then just what, working uh, off of it. No, no, like just bullet point and be like, do this, then this, and this is how I want this worded because you start to realize a lot of language in legal agreements are about edge cases, where it's like, yeah. if this happens or if this happens and all that kind of stuff. And you quickly realize that lawyers are not experts in your field. So you can be doing a deal with someone an agreement, a settlement or whatever, they don't know. They're just guessing. And a lot of people leave business terms up to lawyers, which is a 
terrible idea because they're doing the best they can. I'm not blaming them, but you come to me and go, Hey, Greg, what are 10 things you should make that I should make sure are in this agreement? I'm working with XYZ company. I'd be like, I don't even know what they're exactly like, does maybe number of connections matter? Yeah. No lawyer is going to know to include number of connections. No, you know your business the best, right? That, that comes down to that. <laughs> through an agreement and really understand what's happening and be able to give specific actionable changes was maybe one of the things I'd be really happy with and became very comfortable in doing that. I can have a conversation with uh, my lawyer and just, or my attorney and say, Hey, I think we need to do this. Let's push back on this. Let's tweak these wordings here, that kind of stuff. And that's only through tons and tons of, I guess, legal expenses and agreements but it is something that people shouldn't shy away from. And there's certain owners or certain business uh, founders, especially that have a tendency to do, Oh, I not just fine, but whatever. Have a tendency leave it to, to the lawyer, leave it to the lawyer. And yeah. I think a lot of people forget that there's a difference between an in-house lawyer and an external lawyer. Cause an in-house lawyer is going to understand the business a lot more. They're going to seek out the experts. They're going to make sure that kind of stuff is done. Whereas an yeah. external, they care, but they just don't know. Yeah. And they may feel bad asking too many details or they'll say, hey, can you give me a summary of all the things you care about? How's it get worded? All these types of things. So I would definitely say that a huge skill set is being comfortable reading through legal agreements and not hating it. Like I'll read through miscellaneous laws in our yeah. province and that kind of stuff just to sort of understand. I find it kind of interesting. You're like, okay, I didn't realize that's the exact penalty for <laughs> trust pass or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. And you sort of uh, kind of appreciate the language that actually means something. And I also see lawyers, and I'll end it at this. I have no issue with lawyers. A lot of people have this general hate towards them. Um, lawyers only do what the clients want them to do for all intents and purposes. Uh, now let's take personal injury lawyers out that convince people to launch. <laughs> That's good. That's good. You have to leave that out. I'm a business lawyer here for a second. I see them as insurance. You and I can come up with an agreement on the back of a piece of paper, we have some bullet points, we both sign it, it's completely valid. Yeah. However, we may not have factored in that you're, I'm paying you to take care of my dog for the next five years and I pay you a yearly thing. And then my dog dies. Do I still need to pay you every year? According to the agreement? Yeah, because it was yeah. not worded with anything. That's where you sort of bring in a lawyer that they hopefully are dealing with these edge cases that you don't think about. Yeah. Um, it's not for them to write it in pretty language. That's not needed. It's really yeah. more for them to be like, hey, you've been through this. What are things that have been missed in the past? Uh, shareholders agreements would be a great example of that. These things have been built over the years and years. It's like a checklist for them. They, have, they, have, they know all the little nuances. Yeah. Exactly. Years and years of tried and true language that if you and I were to come with a shareholders agreement, it would be like if we were starting back in the 20s. We'd when, miss everything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It was the normal, normal stuff. Yeah. So- um, for sure, just become comfortable, uh, with, with attorneys and the whole side of things. And, uh, I'm sure you've even seen in the short time that we work together, right. But just being generally uncomfortable with it, you can yeah. you know, avoid lawyers directly. Like you get them involved, like one or two steps down the road, you sort of, yeah. right. Don't call your big brother in to fight when, <laughs> until you realize that, uh, that it's about to start swinging. Yeah. Yeah. That's some good advice and a good analogy there. All right. Well, Greg, that's all the you time for today. I have one older brother, but I would be the one doing the punching. He's, oh, he's okay. Yeah, I don't have it. No, it's still good enough. You in the ringer? Yeah, I, I'm not a great fighter. I'd be throwing the punches, but I wouldn't be great. I just need uh, you to take. You just take. You need me take him on the chin. You're gonna be hiding behind me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah, thanks for for joining. I think there were some great lessons in there, and uh, I know you have a few others, but uh, a few other stories you could you could go on for another hour about. But uh, I think this one was great, and the audience will uh, will benefit from it. So thanks, Greg, for your story of down but not out. That's good. Have a good one. Cheers. Thanks, Greg. <laughs>